Chapters fifty through fifty three of the Right Away by Gilbert Parker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter fifty, the Passion Play at Chaudiere. For the first time in its history, Chaudiere was becoming notable in the eyes of the outside world. We'll have more girth after this," said Philian Lacasse the saddler to the wife of the notary, as in front of the post office they stood watching a little cavalcade of habitants going up the road towards Four Mountains to rehearse the passion play. If Dauphin's advice had been taken long ago, we'd have had a hotel at Four Mountains, and the city folk would be coming here for the summer," said Madame Dauphin with a superior air. "Fish," said a voice behind them. It was the Signor's groom with a straw in his mouth. He had a gloomy mind. There isn't a house but has two or three boarders. I've got three, said Philly and the Cass. They come tomorrow. We'll have ten at the manor, but no good will come of it, said the groom. No good? Look at the infidel tailor, said Madame Dauphin. He translated all the writing. He drew all the dresses and made a hundred pictures. There they are, at the curé's house. He should have played Judas said the groom malevolently, that it be right for him. "'Perhaps you don't like the fashion play?' said Madame Dauphin disdainfully. "'We ain't through with it yet,' said the death-set groom. "'It is a pious and holy mission,' said Madame Dauphin. "'Even that Joe Portugais worked night and day till he went away to Montreal, and he always goes to Mass now. He's to take Pontius Pilate when he comes back. Then look at Virginie Morset that put her brother's eyes out quarrelling. She's to play Mary Magdalene. I could fit the parts better, said the groom. Of course, you'd have played St. John, said the saddler, or maybe Christus himself. I'd have Paulette Dubois play Mary the Sinner. Magdalene repented and knelt at the foot of the cross. She was sorry and sinned no more, said the notary's wife in querulous reprimand. Well, Paulette does all that said the stolid, dark-visaged groom. Philly and Lacasse's ears pricked up. How do you know? She hasn't come back? Hasn't she, though? And with her child, too, last night. Her child? Madame Dauphin was scandalized and amazed. The groom nodded. And doesn't care who knows it. Seven years old and as fine a child as ever was. Narcisse! Narcisse! called Madame Dauphin to her husband, who was coming up the street. She hastily repeated the groom's news to him. The notary stuck his hand between the buttons of his waistcoat. "'Well, well, my dear madame,' he said consequentially. "'It is quite true.' "'What do you know about it? Whose child is it?' she asked with curdling scorn. "'Shh!' said the notary. Then, with an oratorical wave of his free hand, the church opens her arms to all, even to her who sinned much because she loved much who through woeful years searched the world for her child and found it not, hidden away as it was by the duplicity of sinful man, and so on through tangled sentences, setting forth in broken terms Paulette Dubois' life. "'How do you know all about it?' asked the saddler. "'I've known it for years,' said the notary grandly, stoutly too, for he would freely risk his wife's anger that the vain glory of the moment might be enlarged. "'And you keep it even from madame?' said the saddler, with a smile too broad to be sarcastic. Tiens, if I did that, my wife had picked my eyes out with a badal. It was a professional secret, said the notary, with a desperate resolve to hold his position. I'm going home, Dauphin. Are you coming? questioned his wife with an air. You will remain and hear what I've got to say. This Paulette Dubois, she should play Mary Magdalene for. Look, look, what's that? said the saddler. He pointed to a wagon coming slowly up the road. In front of it a team of dogs drew a cart. It carried something covered with black. "'It's a funeral. There's the coffin. It's on Joe Portiquet's little cart,' added Philly and Lacasse. "'Ah, God be merciful. It's Rosalie Evanterel and Mrs. Flynn, and Monsieur Evanterel in the coffin,' said Madame Dauphin, running to the door of the post-office to call the curé's sister." "'There'll be use enough for the baker's dead march now,' remarked M. Dauphin sadly, buttoning up his coat, taking off his hat, and going forward to greet Rosalie. As he did so, Charlie appeared in the doorway of his shop. "'Look, Monsieur,' said the notary, "'this is the way Rosalie Vanterell comes home with her father.' "'I will go for the curé,' Charlie answered, turning white. 
He leaned against the doorway for a moment to steady himself, then hurried up the street. He did not dare meet Rosalie or go near her yet. For her sake it was better not. That tailor infidel has a heart. His eyes were leaking, said the notary to Philly and Lacasse, and went on to meet the mournful cavalcade. End of chapter 50 Chapter 51 Face to Face If I could only understand! This was Rosalie's constant cry in these weeks wherein she lay ill and prostrate after her father's burial. Once and once only had she met Charlie alone, though she knew that he was keeping watch over her. She had first seen him the day her father was buried, standing apart from the people, his face sorrowful, his eyes heavy, his figure bowed. The occasion of their meeting alone was the first night of her return, when the notary and Charlie had kept watch beside her father's body. She had gone into the little hallway and had looked into the room of death. The notary was sound asleep in his armchair, but Charlie sat silent and moveless, his eyes gazing straight before him. She murmured his name, and though it was only to herself, not even a whisper, he got up quickly and came to the hall, where she stood grief-stricken, yet with a smile of welcome, of forgiveness, of confidence. As she put out her hand to him, and his swallowed it, she could not but say to him, So contrary is the heart of a woman, so does she demand a yes by asserting a no, and hunger for the eternal assurance, she could not but say, You do not love me, now? It was but a whisper, so faint and breathless that only the heart of love could hear it. There was no answer in words, for someone was stirring beyond Rosalie in the dark, and a great figure heaved through the kitchen doorway, but his hand crushed hers in his own. His heart said to her, My love is an undying light. It will not change for time or tears. The words they had read together, in a little snuff-colored book on the counter in the shop one summer day, a year ago. The words flashed into his mind, and they were carried to hers. Her fingers pressed his, and then Charlie said over her shoulder to the approaching Mrs. Flynn, Do not let her come again, madame. She should get some sleep. And he put her hand in Mrs. Flynn's. Be good to her, as you know how, Mrs. Flynn, he added gently. He had won the heart of Mrs. Flynn that moment, and it may be she had a conviction or an inspiration, for she said in a softer voice than she was wont to use to any one save Rosalie, I do buy her as you do by your own, sir, and tenderly drew Rosalie to her own room. Such had been their first meeting after her return. Afterwards she was taken ill, and the torture of his heart drove him out into the night, to walk the road and creep round her house like a sentinel, Mrs. Flynn's words ringing in his ears to reproach him. I'll do by her as you would do by your own, sir. Night after night it was the same, and Rosalie heard his footsteps and listened and was less sorrowful, because she knew that she was ever in his thoughts but one day Mrs. Flynn came to him in his shop. "'She's wantin' a word with ye on business,' she said, and gestured towards the little house across the way. "'Tis few words ye do be spakin' to anybody, but if ye have kind words to spake and good things to say, ye needn't be bitin' your tongue,' she added in response to his nod, and left him. Charlie looked after her with a troubled face. On the instant it seemed to him that Mrs. Flynn knew all but his second thought told him that it was only an instinct on her part that there was something between them, the beginning of love, maybe. In another half-hour he was beside Rosalie's chair. "'Perhaps you are angry,' she said as he came towards her, where she sat in the great armchair. She did not give him time to answer, but hurried on. "'I wanted to tell you that I have heard you every night outside, and that I have been glad and sorry, too.' so sorry for us both. Rosalie, Rosalie, he said hoarsely, and dropped on a knee beside her chair, and took her hand and kissed it. He did not dare do more. I wanted to say to you, she said, dropping a hand on his shoulder, that I do not blame you for anything, not for anything. Yet I want you to be sorry too. I want you to feel as sorry for me as I feel sorry for you. 
I am the worst man, and you the best woman in the world. She leaned over him with tears in her eyes. Hush, she said. I want to help you, Charles. You are wise. You know ten thousand things more than I. But I know one thing you do not understand. You know and do whatever is good, he said brokenly. Oh, no, no, no. But I know one thing, because I have been taught, and because it was born with me. Perhaps much was habit with me in the past, but now I know that one thing is true. It is God. She paused. I have learned so much since, since then. He looked up with a groan and put a finger on her lips. You are feeling bitterly sorry for me, she said. But you must let me speak. That is all I ask. It is all love asks. I cannot bear that you should not share my thoughts. That is the thing that has hurt, hurt so all these months, these long, hard months, when I could not see you and did not know why I could not. Don't shake so, please, hear me to the end, and we shall both be the better after. I felt it all so cruelly because I did not, and I do not, understand. I rebelled, but not against you. I rebelled against myself, against what you called fate. Fate is oneself what one brings on oneself. But I had faith in you, always, always, even when I thought I hated you. Ah, hate me, hate me, it is your loving that cuts me to the quick, he said. You have the magnanimity of God. Her eyes leapt up. Of God? You believe in God? she said eagerly. God is God to you? He is the one thing that has come out of all this to me. She reached out her hand and took her Bible from a table. Read that to yourself, she said and opening the book pointed to a passage. He read it. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou art naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? Closing the book, Charlie said, I understand, I see. Will you say a prayer with me? she urged. It is all I ask. It is the only, the only thing I want to hurt you, because it may make you happier in the end. What keeps us apart I do not know. But if you will say one prayer with me, I will keep on trusting, I will never complain, and I will wait, wait. He kissed both her hands, but the look in his eyes was that of a man being broken on the wheel. She slipped to the floor, her rosary in her fingers. Let us pray, she said simply, and in a voice as clear as a child's, but with the anguish of a woman's struggling heart behind. He did not move. She looked at him, caught his hands in both of hers, and cried, but you will not deny me this. Haven't I the right to ask it? Haven't I a right to ask of you a thousand times as much? You have the right to ask all that is mine to give life, honor, my body in pieces inch by inch, the last that I can call my own. But, Rosalie, this is not mine to give. How can I pray unless I believe? You do, oh, you do believe in God, she cried passionately. Rosalie, my life, he urged hoarse misery in his voice. The only thing I have to give you is the bare soul of a truthful man. I am that now, at least. You have made me so. If I deceived the whole world, if I was as the thief upon the cross, I should still be truthful to you. You open your heart to me. Let me open mine to you, to see it as it is. Once my soul was like a watch, cased and carried in the pocket of life, uncertain, untrue because it was a soul made, not born. I must look at the hands to know the time, and because it varied, because the working did not answer to the absolute, I said, The soul is a lie. You, you have changed all that, Rosalie. My soul now is like a dial of the sun, but the clouds are there above, and I do not know what time it is in life. When the clouds break, if they ever break, and the sun shines, the dial will speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
He paused, confused, for he had repeated the words of a witness taking the oath in court. "'So help me God,' she finished the oath for him. Then, with a sudden change of manner, she came to her feet with a spring. She did not quite understand. She was, however, dimly conscious of the power she had over his chivalrous mind, the power of the weak over the strong, the tyranny of the defendant over the defender. She was a woman tortured beyond bearing, and she was fighting for her very life, mad with anguish as she struggled. "'I don't understand you,' she cried with flashing eyes. "'One minute you say you do not believe in anything, and the next you say, so help me God.' "'Ah, no, you said that, Rosalie,' he interposed gently. "'You said I was as magnanimous as God. You were laughing at me then, mocking me, whose only fault is that I loved and trusted you. In the wickedness of your heart you robbed me of happiness, you—' "'Don't, don't, Rosalie, Rosalie!' he exclaimed in a shrinking protest. That she had spoken to him as her deepest heart abhorred only increased her agitated denunciation. "'Yes, yes, in your mad selfishness you did not care for the poor girl who forgot all, lost all, and now—' She stopped short at the sight of his white, awe-stricken face. His eyeglass seemed like a frost of death over an eye that looked upon some shocking scene of woe. Yet he appeared not to see, for his fingers fumbled on his waistcoat for the monocle, fumbled vaguely, helplessly. It was the realization of a soul cast into the outer darkness. Her abrupt silence came upon him like the last engulfing wave to a drowning man, the final assurance of the end in which there is quiet and the deadly smother. "'Now I know the truth,' he said, in a curious even tone, different from any she had ever heard from him. It was the old Charlie Steele who spoke, the Charlie Steele in whom the intellect was supreme once more, the judicial spirit, the inveterate intelligence which put justice before all, was alive in him, almost rejoicing in its regained governance. The new Charlie was as dead as the old had been of late and this clarifying moment left the grim impression behind that the old law was not obsolete. He felt that in the abandonment of her indignation she had mercilessly told the truth, and the irreducible quality of mind in him, which in the old days made for justice, approved. There was a new element now, however, that conscience which never possessed him fully until the day he saw Rosalie go traveling over the hills with her crippled father that picture of the girl against the twilight her figure silhouetted in the clear air had come to him in sleeping and waking dreams the type and sign of an everlasting melancholy as he looked at her blindly now he saw not herself but that melancholy figure out of the distance his own voice said again now i know the truth she had struck with a violence she did not intend which she knew must rend her own heart in the future, which put in the dice-box the last hope she had. But she could not have helped it. She could not have stayed the words, though a suspended sword were to fall with the same. It was the cry of tradition and religion, and every home-bred convent-nurtured habit, the instinct of heredity, the wail of woman for whom destiny or man or nature has arranged the disproportionate share of life's penalties. It was the impotent rebellion against the first curse that man in his punishment should earn his bread by the sweat of his brow, which he might do with joy, while the woman must work out her ordained sentence in sorrow all the days of her life. In her bitter words was the inherent revolt of the race of woman, but now she suddenly felt that she had flung him an infinite distance from her, that she had struck at the thing she most cherished, his belief that she loved him that even if she had told the truth, and she felt she had not, it was not the truth she wished him most to feel. For an instant she stood looking at him, shocked and confounded. Then her changeless love rushed back on her. The maternal and protective spirit welled up, and with a passionate cry she threw herself into the chair again in very weakness, with outstretched hands, saying, "'Forgive me, oh, forgive me, I did not mean it, oh, forgive your Rosalie!' Stooping over her, he answered, It is good for me to know the whole truth. What hurts you may give me will pass, for life must end, and my life cannot be long enough to pay the price of the hurts I have given you. 
I could bear a thousand, one for every hour, if they could bring back the light to your eye, the joy to your heart. Could prayer, do you think, make me sorrier than I am? I have hurt what I would have spared from hurt at the cost of my life and all the lives in the world, he added fiercely. Forgive me, oh, forgive me, Rosalie, she pleaded. I did not know what I was saying. I was mad. It was all so sane and true, he said, like one who, on the brink of death, finds a satisfaction in speaking the perfect truth. I am glad to hear the truth. I have been such a liar. She looked up startled, her tears blinding her. You have not deceived me, she asked bitterly. Oh, you have not deceived me. You have loved me, have you not? It was that which mattered, that only. Moveless and eager she looked, looked at him waiting, as it were, for sentence. I never lied to you, Rosalie. Never, he answered, and he touched her hand. She gave a moan of relief at his words. Oh, then, she said in a low voice, and the tears in her eyes dried away. I meant that until I knew you, I kept deceiving myself and others all my life. But without knowing it? she said eagerly. Perhaps without quite knowing it. Until you knew me? she asked in quick quavering tones. Till I knew you, he answered. Then I have done you good, not ill? she asked with painful breathlessness. The only good there may be in me is you, and you only, he said. And he choked something rising in his throat, seeing the greatness of her heart, her dear desire to have entered into his life to his own good. He would have said that there was no good in him at all, but that he wished to comfort her. A little cry of joy broke from her lips. Oh, that, that, she cried with happy tears. Won't you kiss me now? she added softly. He clasped her in his arms, and though his eyes were dry, his heart wept tears of blood. End of chapter 51 Chapter 52 The Coming of Billy Chaudier had made and lost a reputation the passion play in the valley had become known to a whole country to the cures and the seigneurs unavailing regret they had meant to revive the great story for their own people and the indians a homely beautiful object lesson in an eden like innocence and quiet and repose but behold the world had invaded them the vanity of the notary had undone them he had written to the great papers of the province, telling of the advent of the play, and pilgrimages had been organized, and excursions had been made to the spot, where a simple people had achieved a crude but notable picture of the life and death of the hero of Christendom. The curé viewed with consternation the invasion of their quiet. It was no longer his own chaudier, and when on a Sunday his dear people were jostled from the church to make room for strangers, his gentle eloquence seemed to forsake him. He spoke haltingly, and his intoning of the mass lacked the old soothing simplicity. "'Ah, my dear Signor,' he said, on the Sunday before the playing was to end, "'we have overshot the mark.' The Signor nodded and turned his head away. "'There is an English play which says, "'I have shot mine arrow o'er the house and hurt my brother. "'That's it, that's it. "'We began with religion.' and we end with greed and pride and notoriety. What do we want of fame? The price is too high, Maurice. Fame is not good for the hearts and minds of simple folk. It will soon be over. I dread a sordid reaction. The Signor stood thinking for a moment. I have an idea, he said at last. Let us have these last days to ourselves. The mission ends next Saturday at five o'clock. We will announce that all strangers must leave the valley by Wednesday night. Then, during those last three days, while yet the influence of the play is on them, you can lead your own people back to the old quiet feelings. My dear Maurice, it is worthy of you. It is the way. We will announce it today. And see now, for those three days we will change the principles, lest those who have taken the part so long have lost the pious awe which should be upon them. We will put new people in their places. I will announce it at Vespers presently. I have in my mind who should play the Christ and St. John and St. Peter. The men are not hard to find. But for Mary the mother and Mary Magdalene. The eyes of the two men suddenly met. A look of understanding passed between them. Will she do it? said the Seigneur. 
The curé nodded. Pauline Dubois has heard the word. Go and sin no more. She will obey. Walking through the village as they talked, the curé shrank back painfully several times, for voices of strangers singing festive songs rolled out upon the road. "'Who can they be?' he said distressfully. Without a word the signor went to the door of the inn whence the sounds proceeded, and without knocking entered. A moment afterwards the voices stopped, but broke out again, quieted, then once more broke out, and presently the signor issued from the door, white with anger, three strangers behind him. All were intoxicated. One was violent. It was Billy Wantage, whom the years had not improved. He had arrived that day with two companions, an excursion of curiosity as an excuse for a spree. "'What's the matter with you, old stick in the mud?' he shouted. "'Mass is over, isn't it? Can't we have a little guzzle between prayers?' By this time a crowd had gathered, among them Fillion Lacasse. At a motion from the Signor, and a whisper that went round quickly, a dozen inhabitants swiftly sprang on the three men, pinioned their arms, and carried them bodily to the pump by the tavern, held them under it, one by one, till each was soaked and sober. Then their horses and wagon were brought, and they were given five minutes to leave the village. With a devilish look in his eye, and drenched and furious, Billy was disposed to resist the command. But the faces around him were determined, and muttering curses, the three drove away towards the next parish. End of chapter 52 Chapter 53 The Signor and the Curé Have a Suspicion Presently the Signor and the Curé stood before the door of the tailor's shop. The Curé was about to knock when the Signor laid a hand upon his arm. "'There is no use. He has been gone several days,' he said. "'Gone? Gone?' said the Curé. "'I came to see him yesterday, and not finding him, I asked at the post-office.' And the Signor's voice lowered. He told Mrs. Flynn he was going into the hills, so Rosalie says. The Curé's face fell. He went away also just before the play began. I almost fear that—that that we will get no nearer. His mind prompts him to do good and not evil, and yet I have dreamed a good dream, Maurice, but I sometimes fear I have dreamed in vain. Wait, wait! M. Loisel looked towards the post office musingly. I have thought sometimes that what man's prayers may not accomplish, a woman's love might do. If—but, alas, what do we know of his past? nothing. What do we know of his future? Nothing. What do we know of the human heart? Nothing, nothing. The Signor was astounded. The Curé's meaning was plain. What do you mean? he asked almost gruffly. She, Rosalie, has changed, changed. In his heart he dwelt sorrowfully upon the fact that she had not been to confession to him for many, many months. Since her father's death, since her illness, since she went to Montreal seven months ago, even while she was so ill these past weeks, she never asked for me. And when I came, ah, uh, if it is that her heart has gone out to the man, and his does not respond. A good thing, too, said the other gloomily. We don't know where he came from, and we do know that he is but a pagan. Yet there she sits now, hour after hour, day after day, so changed. She lost her father, urged Emra Signal anxiously. I know the grief of children. This is not such a grief. This is something more. But I cannot ask. If she were a sinner, but she is without fault. Have we not watched her grow up here, mirthful, brave, pure-souled? Fitted for any station, interposed the Signor huskily. Presently he laid a hand upon the curé's arm. Shall I ask her again? he said, breathing hard. Do you think she has found out her mistake? The curé was so taken aback that at first he could not speak. When he realized, however, he could scarce suppress a smile at the other's simple vanity. But he mastered himself and said, "'It is not that, Maurice. It is not you.' "'How did you know I had asked her?' asked his friend querulously. "'You have just told me.' Emra Signal felt a kind of reproval in the curé's tone. It made him a little nervous. "'I'm an old fool, but she needed someone,' he protested. At least I am a gentleman, and she would not be thrown away. Dear Maurice, said the curé, and linked his arm in the others. In all respects save one, it would have been to her advantage. 
but youth is the only comrade for youth all else is evasion of life's laws the signor pressed his arm i thought you less worldly wise than myself i find you more he said not worldly wise life is deeper than the world or worldly wisdom come we will both go and see rosalie emra signal suddenly stopped at the post-office door and half turned towards the tailor's shop he is young suppose that he drew her love his way but gave her nothing in return and if it were so the cure paused and his face darkened if it were so he should leave her forever and so my dream would end and rosalie rosalie would forget to remember youth must see and touch and be near else it wears itself out in excess of feeling youth feels more deeply than age but it must bear daily witness upon my honour cure you shall write your little philosophies for the world said emra signal and then knocked at the door i will go in alone maurice the cure urged good you are right answered the other i will go write the proclamation denying strangers the valley after wednesday i will enforce it too he added with vigour and turning walked up the street as mrs flynn admitted the cure to the post office a half hour later m loisel again appeared at the post office door a pale beautiful face at his shoulder he had not been brave enough to say what was on his mind but as he bade her good-bye he plucked up needful courage forgive me rosalie he said but i have sometimes thought that you have more griefs than one i have thought he paused and then went on bravely that there might be there might be unwelcome love or love deceived a mist came before her eyes but she quietly and firmly answered i have never been deceived in love monsieur loisel there there he hurriedly and gently rejoined do not be hurt my child i only want to help you a moment afterwards he was gone as the door closed behind him she drew herself proudly up i have never been deceived she said aloud i love him love him love him end of chapter fifty three recording by tom weiss tom's audiobooks dot com